All right, welcome back everyone. Um, and thanks for returning to State of the World. We are very pleased after a terrific opening panel to turn to what I know is gonna be an excellent second panel. And this panel reflects the overarching theme of our conference, the struggle for democracy. Moderating uh, this session is Fred Hyatt, who's the editor of the editorial page at the Washington Post, a position he's held for more than 20 years. And this year, if I'm right, Fred, uh, marks your 40th anniversary at the Post, which is uh, quite a milestone. So congratulations on that. And in 2011, when I was uh, the president of Freedom House, we gave Fred and the Washington Post editorial page our Raising Awareness Award for their tremendous work in keeping the spotlight on democracy and human rights issues around the world. So Fred, delighted you can join us today to moderate this session. Over to you. Thank you, David, uh, for including me in this conference uh, and this crucial panel. Um, <clears throat> we have a great panel, as you noted, and um, so we have more time for <clears throat> conversation. I'm not gonna do long introductions. I think uh, most of you know our speakers and there's more about them in the program. Um, very briefly, um, we have Michael Abramowitz, uh, who uh, runs Freedom House, before that, he was at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. And uh, of course, the high point of his career was his many years at the Washington Post. Um, <clears throat> Nicole Bibbin Sadaka uh, at Georgetown University. She's the deputy director uh, of the Master of Science program in the Foreign Service School. I probably got that slightly wrong. Um, and uh, also has uh, served at uh, the State Department and IRI, which in turn is represented here today by Daniel Twining, president of the International Republican Institute, um, also formerly stints in the State Department and uh, longtime foreign policy advisor, Senator John McCain. And <clears throat> finally, Derek Mitchell, um, president of the National Democratic Institute, um, served as our ambassador to Myanmar, also known as Burma, from 2012 to 2016, I think. <clears throat> he was our, the America's first ambassador there in over two decades. Um, also has served in the State Department and the Defense Department. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, welcome to everybody who's listening. Um, for better or worse, there's a lot going on in the world uh, at this minute that is relevant to our conversation. Um, <clears throat> in uh, Myanmar this morning, in Moscow and St. Petersburg and across Russia yesterday. Um, and I know we're gonna wanna talk about that news and what it says for some of the broader themes um, of this the panel and, and of this conference all week. Um, but I, I start, contrary to my news instincts, I thought I would just ask each of you to take literally two minutes um, because we were told no long opening statements, but give me two minutes on, on um, what you think is the central challenge, what you're most worried about when we look at the fate of democracy in the US and around the world um, at this very moment. And, Let's start with that and then we'll go to some specific cases. Um, <clears throat> and uh, maybe we'll just do it in alphabetical order, which would be Mike first and then Nicole and then Derek and then Dan. Thanks, Fred. Uh, it's been all downhill since I left the post. So uh, good to see you. Uh, for, for, for the democracy in the world as well as for the Washington Post. So. For both, for both actually. Um, you know, I, uh, I would just say that 2020 was really not a very good year for democracy at all. And while like, in general, I'm a glass half full kind of guy and like to look at the positive things, I'm really afraid to say it's a pretty grim picture as the events uh, in, from Myanmar just this morning and overnight are reflecting. Uh, you know, democracy is suffering from really long-term deterioration you know, authoritarian actors are, are gaining ground. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party is really, I think, exercising its uh, efforts to, you know, accelerate this global deterioration, you know, trying to co-opt multilateral institutions and, 
and weakening accountability mechanisms, dismantling freedom in, in Hong Kong. And so really the mass protests that we saw in 2019 and 2020 that we had all seen as like a beacon of hopeful change and that really uh, are seen as uh, a sign of the continuing demand for democracy you know, are, are really under threat. And uh, the one, I guess, the one single thing that I would add that you have to add to this equation, which we were quite worried about at Freedom House, is the impact of the pandemic uh, and uh, the uh, way in which the pandemic is really giving authoritarian powers uh, uh, much more wind at their sail to, to crack down on rights. Uh, so I'll just stop there, but that's a, just a brief reaction to your question. Excellent, I'll jump in after that. Thanks, Mike. Um, thank you, Fred, for hosting and, and David for pulling an incredible con uh, uh, conference together again. Um, I'll flag three things. One, starting building on what um, Mike said, I think the great power competition between um, China and the United States in which the United States has been out of the game for the last four years, in fact, presenting a negative example of uh, what democracy looked like in practice, um, combined with China aggressively um, advancing an alternative system both within international organizations as well as globally around the world and its bilateral relations has created a significant challenge to, uh, to democracy. The second thing I would flag is misinformation and disinformation that um, through the internet, through malicious actors like uh, Russia and uh, Iran and others who are intentionally undermining um, information flow and limiting information flow, um, the sense of accurate information has been lost in many countries. And I think our country is, is facing that challenge. Um, and the third I would say is um, mistrust in weak institutions. And many places around the world, people are feeling that democracy is not delivering on what they had hoped. And so they are losing trust in institutions and those institutions in countries where those um, places where the institutions are weak are not able to then prove to their citizens that they are worthy of their trust. And that has created a virtuous cycle of um, mistrust and uh, failing institutions in a number of places. <clears throat> a lot in both of those that we're gonna to wanna to come back to, um, but let's go on to Derek. Yeah, well, thank you, Fred. And thank you, David. Thank you, FIU and McKean Institute for the invitation. Very timely and important topic. Um, I agree with everything my, my, uh, my colleagues have said here. I would accentuate the information issue for me, which is beyond the disinformation challenge from foreign countries, but it, it's the very algorithms, the very way the digital space is configured and structured uh, contributes to um, a plethora of, of uh, bad information and lack of distinguishing what is fact and what is not. And the inability to have quality information and for citizens to understand the difference between a fact and a lie or a, uh, a, a, an inauthentic kind of uh, um, uh, information is a real huge challenge of democracy fundamentally. So that's a big issue. Uh, secondly, I would say the culture questions. I mean, it's one thing to have, um, to have institutions and have processes, but the mindset of democracy, the ability to understand that your adversary or your competitor is not your enemy. Um, that is a change of mindset in a lot of countries and it's a, it's a problem we have in our own. But uh, we see that overnight, even in Burma, that the, the personal, a lot of things that went into it, but the personality conflicts um, that, that um, override any sense of democratic process, um, that, that I think is, is fundamental. And let me just finish, because I don't want to go past two minutes, with a positive, because we're starting off with all the negatives. <laughs> um, that, and I'm sure Dan will talk about this as well, because we like to focus a little bit on where there's resilience. Uh, one is just looking at youth around the world and young people. Um, there may be questions about whether young people are committed to democracy, but I would say that what we're seeing around the world, whether it's in Russia or Belarus or everywhere, you're seeing people who still demand to have a say in their own affairs. They're taking to the streets even during a pandemic and during pandemic conditions to demand their rights and are not embracing authoritarianism, do not believe that that model works for them and that the China model works for them. So the, the foundational support for free society 
and for free speech and for oversight of government, transparent, accountable, inclusive government is still extremely strong around the world. And we see it every day in the streets. The question is how you harness that energy into productive political end to do as Nicole suggested, which is to show that democracy can deliver. That it's not just the action of a moment, but that it's the embedding of a process over time that remains a work in progress. Thank you, <clears throat> um, Dan. Thanks, Fred. It's great to see you. Thanks to you and the post editorial page for your moral clarity in championing democracy uh, around the world. Uh, thanks to FIU and David Kramer and the McCain Institute also for their leadership uh, uh, in this uh, vital cause. So I agree with everything that's been said, so I won't try to repeat it. But really just to say, uh, just to amplify a bit, that people are not out in the streets demanding authoritarianism, as, as Derek suggests. People are not demanding more corrupt and out of touch political elites. They are not demanding less responsive governance. All over the world, as Mike suggested, uh, we have seen people uh, actually in some of the toughest places in the world, uh, in Hong Kong, in uh, Siberia, uh, in Belarus, uh, all over the place, in Uganda, uh, in Venezuela, demanding uh, the dignity that comes from very basic freedom and responsive governance. So we should not be down on the cause of democracy. Actually, I think there is a greater demand for uh, responsive and effective and good citizen-centric governance than ever before. Uh, I think what I worry about, Fred, is that politicians have let people down all over the world, that democracy has not delivered. And, and there is a confusion out there uh, between the idea that somehow democracy is no longer the shining star, it's no longer the aspiration of billions of people uh, with the fact that democracy has not delivered. So what we need to do is double down in the campaign to support human rights and uh, a popular voice and the role of women and youth in political life right, that this is not somehow an unpopular cause. And actually authoritarians are fundamentally afraid of these things, which is why they are fighting back so hard, so hard in Hong Kong, uh, in Belarus, uh, in Russia and around the world, in Burma, as I know we'll be talking about. So uh, we should be clear about which side we stand on and we should remember, and I'll close with this, the polling shows that as many as three and four Americans believe we should support human rights and democracy in the world. It's not an unpopular cause. Uh, the question is, how can we do this uh, effectively, given how uh, tough it is out there? Great, interesting, um, <clears throat> and uh, a lot to chew over. I'm, uh, this idea that uh, there's still a lot of demand for democracy, which um, several of you point out, <clears throat> um, but tempered by what Nicole said, and uh, of you know, is that demand going to diminish if people feel democracy is not delivering? Um, and, uh, and another big question, which I, I know we all want to come back to, uh, have the authoritarians found a better way to fight back uh, so that the demand uh, is not uh, managing to, to get through? Um, but, so before we go to all those general questions, though, as long as we have Derek here, who's uh, one of America's greatest experts on Myanmar, and this happened overnight, um, and I know it's on everybody's mind, let me ask you, um, Derek, so the military still had a constitution <clears throat> that gives them 25% of parliament. Uh, basically, they've been able to keep pretty good control, I think most people would think. They just lost an election badly, but they still had that constitution. So what explains uh, this, this decision uh, of theirs? Yeah, well, it's hard to get in their minds entirely. You're exactly right. Many people had assumed that they had a system that actually that worked for them, but they were very frustrated under that system as well. Um, there were evidence of that. There's also, as I mentioned, alluded to earlier, very bad personal relations that had developed between uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and the military and the NLD and, and, um, and the commander in chief. Um, so, and the commander in chief, another explanation people are, are putting out there, the commander in chief this year has had to, was supposed to resign. He's hit his 65th year. He was supposed to move on in July. Um, and uh, it was not a secret that he was uh, not ready to give up all his power and authority. So the question is whether they could have carved out a place for him or what he would do in that circumstance was always hanging over this transition. 
Um, and they're using these uh, electoral concerns, these disputes over the election that they continue to harp on um, to say that this election was fraudulent uh, and taken over as a result. And, and now you see the old guard back. You just saw, I just saw a list a moment ago of all the new ministers that are provisional ministers. And it's just foreign minister from when I was there five years ago. It's the same guy. Uh, a lot of the same people back in. Hmm. Um, so it's just bad news. And um, it's hard to know what can reverse this at this point. Sorry. Um, that's going to be my next question. But before we get there, I think yeah. a lot of Americans just are interested in this saga of Aung San Suu Kyi and who was a, a human rights hero. And then to those of us who aren't experts, it seemed over the last few years as though she changed and um, has been supportive of the military and including on the Rohingya. Uh, uh, so did, did she make the wrong bet or was she not as supportive did the military not feel she was as supportive as it looked like to us? Or how do you interpret that? People, people misunderstood what was going on during that period. Uh, and we can go into the nuance of why she did what she did uh, to support them, for instance, in The Hague. Um, I think she felt, this is my view, that she felt as the leader of the country that she was um, supposed to step up and defend the honor of the country in the international sphere. And in that way, show the military, but also the people writ large that she can be trusted as uh, the representative of, of the Myanmar people. Uh, but there was never a great relationship between her and the sink. And it started off badly in 2015, 2016, after the election. Um, she had no control of what the military did. She didn't get good information about what the military did to the Rohingya in the early weeks after, you know, in 2017, August, September. Um, so I think we did misunderstand how close she was to them. Uh, and that just became more and more tense. And now we see the result of, of that. And so <clears throat> when you say it's not clear what can be done, um, we saw uh, this morning the White House issued a statement. They told us that President Biden has been briefed on it. Uh, they're opposed. They want uh, media freed. Um, her detention ended. All of this is different than what we might have heard 24 hours after a coup in the last four years. But it kind of raises the question, does it make a difference? Um, would the US have had any influence four years ago? Is its influence less now? Uh, and and what, do, what do you think? Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, I always felt, and there was this debate of sanctions versus engagement. And there was a school of thought that when you gave up on sanctions, that you lost leverage. And I never believed that. I don't think any diplomat believes that. There's certainly a certain degree of leverage in sanctions, but in engagement and relationships, you have some leverage to go during times like this, hopefully as a trusted interlocutor and have a hard conversation. Uh, and this situation was you know, desperate for a mediator or someone to talk to both sides in recent days to try to diffuse the track that it was on. And it was very difficult to figure out who can do that and we don't have those types of relationships um, really now. And I think we did lose that in the past four years for a number of reasons, uh, partly because of the Rohingya, Rohingya issue um, that for legitimate reasons, you know, we had a real tense period, but without that ability to have hard conversations of trust with a country and with a part of the country, with an institution like the military that is very xenophobic, very proud um, and doesn't trust easily, that's similar to the NLD, particularly the military, then yeah, I think we have fewer cards to play than we might have otherwise. And we have to look for others who might be able to have those conversations because I don't think the, the hammer you know, of sanctions is going to be enough. Either way, whether we could have prevented this or not, you never know, just like the issue of the Rohingya, you never know. But I do think there were, I do think frankly that it was preventable. I do think we could have done uh, could have done more or the international community could have uh, tried more to try to prevent this um, from, from occurring, which is very unfortunate. And one more before we bring the others in on this, um, we saw fake news become um, a theme that many authoritarians embraced around the world um, <clears throat> after Trump made it a theme. Uh, do you think the echoes that we hear about a rigged election uh, is that coincidental or is that something else that they are deliberately learning from the United States? 
I don't know if they're not the first one to, to say this, the first military or, or uh, failed party to say, well, this was fraudulent and use it as an excuse. Um, it could be, but if they, everyone saw what actually happened in the United States where the vote prevailed, the institutions held and a new government was inaugurated or the one who won the election was inaugurated. So um, I don't know if they could, I, I'm starting to think the analogy is more like Thailand uh, where they saw um, what in, in the middle line, the commander in chief is very close. I think he considers his godfather, basically, um, the uh, commander in chief, uh, Prayut, in, in Thailand. And, you know, he's going that route of let's suspend it for a year and then elections. And then that year becomes two years or three years. And then they can perhaps change the constitution and make it what they want it to be. So that this mistake of the NLD winning every time is, uh, <laughs> does not happen again. And they can control it like the way the ties are doing that now. That's my biggest concern is that they've seen the rules that they thought were rigged in their favor have not worked to their favor. And now they're going to try and change it to try to quote, protect democracy better through a different process now. So we have to be careful of, of that route. And let me just say, going back to your question, Aung San Suu Kyi in the military, I mean, she tried to change this constitution. This, this really rubbed the, the military the wrong way because the, the constitution allows for the military to have extraordinary rights. So she was fighting this through the whole time to try and change this to make a real civilian democratic country. Um, and that created even more tension that I think the military is saying, we can't allow this to come even this close. We have to continue to control this. Interesting. So <clears throat> let me throw it open and uh, others who wanna talk about Myanmar, Burma, please do. Um, but it also kind of points to this larger question. Um, you know, the Biden administration issued a statement saying we want to return to democracy. And President Biden has been very clear that he thinks the United States um, should resume a role of leading democracies and promoting democracy. Uh, how does that look to you all? Is, can the United States go back to democracy promotion the way we did it four years ago? Do we have to think about it differently? Has our image been tarnished um, in a way that will affect that? Uh, or are there ways we could do it smarter? Um, Dan, Dan, maybe you want to lead off since you're in the business. Yes, yeah, sure. No, we all have uh, views on this, including uh, I know you do, Fred. So uh, look, uh, first, I think it's very American of us to think that the struggle for democracy in the world is all about us and that somehow people in Sudan or Armenia or Hong Kong are going to back off because we don't have a perfect democracy in the United States. Uh, fundamentally, uh, the struggle for freedom and dignity is about them. And of course, they do want America to stand with them, right? We've seen that uh, with our warts and all. Uh, they have seen how our democratic institutions have held. They have seen how the most powerful man in the world uh, peacefully left office on January 20th. Uh, and uh, they can only imagine having that in a country like Russia where Putin has ruled for more than two decades. They can only imagine having that in a country like China where Xi Jinping has so personalized rule and built out this total surveillance state, et cetera. So uh, I think we should look out beyond our shores and understand what is happening and concede that it's a tough environment out there, but also understand, Fred, that uh, authoritarians are afraid. Uh, as Derek suggested, the Burmese military is afraid because the NLD got 10 times more uh, seats in parliament in the elections two months ago than the military party did, right? The NLD won 396, the military won something like 33. Uh, in Thailand, you essentially, you essentially have suspended animation where these old guys with stars on their shoulders think they can hold on to power. And young people in Thailand, as in Burma and elsewhere, have totally different ideas. So uh, you see these crackdowns, you see this backlash. But in fact, there is this surge of energy uh, around holding leaders accountable. Uh, Mike mentioned the pandemic. I mean, last thought, uh, if ever uh, there was a case where you wanted to be able to hold political elites accountable, uh, it's after what has gone down in many of our countries over the last year in terms of mismanagement of emergency response, in terms of inadequacy of healthcare provision. So rather the, than the pandemic and the lockdowns and all the emergency controls that executives have wielded, rather than making the world safe for autocracy, I'd say you're going to see a post-pandemic world in which a lot of citizens are going to be demanding accountability. And I think you've already seen that in the United States. Nicole, if I could jump in, yeah, happily. I agree with everything um, that Dan said. And I think when we think about the question of whether the United States should be 
out supporting democracy activists around the world. The question is, do we do it because we are perfect or we do it because democratic ideals are the right thing? If we do it because we're perfect, then we can be out of the game because the United States has never been perfect. We didn't, we didn't lose our perfect track record on January 6th or during the Trump administration. The truth is the United States has a very, very long track record that has a lot of great successes in the case of democracy and a lot of tremendous um, tremendous failures um, in the sense of a country that, that uh, when we look back historically has slavery and segregation and disenfranchisement. The reality is, is the story of American democracy is one in which our dem democratic institutions allowed us to overcome our shortcomings. And that's what we also saw on January 6th. The shortcomings that we see within our society were overcome by the strength and the dedication of those who would use our democratic institutions to push back on the forces that are undemocratic. And that's the story as we go out into the world and talk about democracy and we stand with people who are doing far more courageous work on the ground in Hong Kong or Sudan or other places. Um, the story that we're, we're, we're telling from ours is how we can overcome the challenges with democracy as opposed to the perfection of democracy. And people question whether the United States should be in a leadership role of this. The reality is that the United States leads in the world. Our voice is the one that many countries look to. We still have military, economic, and political strength. So we will be in a leadership role for some time, regardless of what our message is. The question now is in that leadership, what are we gonna choose as our message? And the reality is given that democracy is the only system that, um, that protects rights of people around the world. And it's the system that gives us um, the opportunity to have rule of law that allows for open markets and stronger and stable, more stable societies. Um, our foreign policy and our engagement in the world has to be embedded in these values, which, um, which are as, as important today as they ever have been. And before I, I let Mike jump in on this, Nicole, <clears throat> do you think January 6th and January 20th is being seen around the world as Oh, democracy held a vindication. Uh, in the end, you know, our institutions were strong. The president left, or is it being seen in a less positive light? <clears throat> yes, <laughs> yes to both of your questions. Um, one, I will say, the narrative of those who would love to see the United States tarnished by January sixth, they are spinning it quite vigorously and quite loudly to show that democracy has failed and democracy is a terrible system. And what we have to do is create um, a stronger narrative, which is based on truth and based on the truth and the reality of what happened on January 6th, but also say what happened the night of January 6th when people came back to vote, what happened in, in Georgia on January 6th where an African American and a Jewish American were voted into a Southern state. Um, and those are the stories. We have the choice of how we're gonna step into that narrative. I think for the countries that are gonna try and malign us, they're doing that actively. The countries that are saying, what is going on? We have to walk with them and, uh, you know, a term that we've used several times is with humble confidence, right? Humble about who we are as a nation, but also rock solid confident that the values of democracy didn't change on January 6th. It just means that we have to continue to put our shoulder to the wheel to try and live into those. Mike, do you want to jump on this one? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I obviously agree with Dan and the others, you, you, the basic point that there's a lot that's still great about American democracy and that uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, we came through a very difficult post-election period and, and, and as someone said, you know, the institutions have held. But I think we also have to be kind of honest with ourselves that our brand has been severely tarnished. And if you, you know, even just look at Freedom House scores over the last decade, uh, and I'm not saying this specific as to Trump and in terms of a partisan way, but, but our democratic institutions have really uh, been attenuating over, over 10 years. And this started before Donald Trump became president and it will not end uh, after, despite his departure from the scene, uh, unless we really as a country take seriously the need to try to put our own house in order and to, and to get democracy back functioning the way it, it needs to be. Uh, we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to animate our foreign policy with a uh, values uh, 
from a values lens and, and to make human rights and democracy more of a centerpiece of our foreign policy. But we have to really work on our own democracy for it to work for us to, to have influence in the world. We still have a great brand, but it's been severely tarnished. And I really think that one of the major focuses of, for those who care about democracy, you know, the fate of the United States and our democracy is really, I think, the single most important thing. Obviously, China and Russia, China is a very severe uh, challenge to us. It's the, it's the, uh, uh, it's, it's the most serious uh, threat to dem democracy and human rights in the world today. But unless we get our house in order, we're going to be, you know, kind of fighting that with one hand behind its back. We have to do both. But we really, uh, I, can't, I can't say enough that we have to kind of address the, you know, the, the dysfunctional media ecosystem in which non-truth you know, can, can have such uh, influence. We have to you know, address the, uh, the polarization in our society. We have to address uh, the reality that special interests have a great deal of uh, excessive influence on our political system. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, and so it, I, I really don't, uh, I don't envy the Biden administration because they have to be operating on both fronts at once. Well, so <clears throat> as soon as we fix polarization, then we can move on. That's that'll be easy. <clears throat> um, I think we'll want to come back to the U.S., but let me go back out to the world for a minute. Um, a number of you eloquently talked about uh, the courage that continues to be shown, especially by young people. Um, but not only, of course, uh, in so many parts of the world. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we've seen it in Hong Kong, we've seen it in Thailand uh, that Derek was talking about, um, in Belarus, just recently in Russia, um, in uh, Uganda. Um, and yet, it seems as though authoritarian governments have learned to resist people power and wait it out and uh, not be thrown over by it. I mean, Lukashenko, there he is still. So is that right? Uh, is people power no longer as powerful as it was? Um, and if so, <clears throat> why not? And what's the possible response to that? I don't know, anybody who wants to go first, uh, jump in. <clears throat> Greg, can I just start by saying that, I, you know, I think one thing to appreciate is that uh, we're left with a lot of hard cases. You know, after 1989, Central and Eastern Europe democratized. There was a wave of democratization in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, you've seen openness and reform across East and Southeast Asia over the last 40 years or so. Uh, we're left with the Russias and the Chinas and the Irans and other difficult places, Belarus. And what I've just been impressed by is despite the infertile soil uh, in places like Sudan, uh, you've still seen dictators fall. Uh, I mean, Sudan had a war criminal, uh, according to the International Criminal Court, who had been convicted, who had run that country for 30 years, had hosted Al Qaeda, et cetera, et cetera. He was deposed in a peaceful street revolution. So, uh, you know, I think you can argue it both ways. You can argue that authoritarians are resurgent. And it's, I think the answer to your question, Fred, is in part due to these technology tools uh, that enable them to so effectively suppress dissent and control uh, civic life uh, that Democrats are on the defense. I mean, one of the big challenges, I think for us, you asked earlier, is that do we just go back to the same old democracy assistance? And the answer is no. Uh, we need to think really smartly about new technology tools to make sure the technology does not work for tyranny. I mean, a lot of the most uh, innovative digital technologies were invented in the West, uh, yet dictators are deploying them to suppress dissent and censor their own people and not just censor their own people, right? Uh, the Chinese Communist Party would like to control what the Washington Post writes on its editorial page. Uh, three of us, at least in this call, have been personally sanctioned by the Chinese Communist Party. So there's an attempt to export uh, control of speech. So we have a lot of work to do. Last thing I would say, anti-corruption. Uh, you know, the Navalny video of Putin, which has been seen more, more than 100 million times now, exposing his billion plus palace. That is really uh, the Achilles heel of many of these regimes, is that they are personal self-enrichment rackets for a small group of leaders. And once that is exposed, it's very hard to hold on. Uh, Lukashenko will find it very hard to hold on in the long term. Yeah, 
if I may just add on to what Dan said, I think that we have to stop looking at this as like something that's going to turn around in a year or two. We are in a sort of a generational struggle. And to me, the story of Sudan that Dan briefly mentioned is very relevant here. You know, that's, a, that's an issue that I've been following for some time when I was at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, we were quite concerned about the genocide in Darfur. And, and honestly, I never thought that, uh, that at least for some time that there would you know, ever be an opening in, in Sudan. It just seemed as if the, uh, the government had, 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 you know, had a permanent control on, on people's aspirations. But you know, that's a case where it was not outsiders who lifted up the Sudanese people. It was the Sudanese, Sudanese people themselves. It was, uh, it was doctors and lawyers and professionals you know, who helped mobilize uh, opposition to uh, the regime there. And you now have a situation where a war criminal, you know, could possibly face uh, uh, extradition uh, to, the, to the Hague to stand trial for genocide. So it, Sudan is a, you know, gives me a lot of hope. And to me, it says we have to really focus on supporting people like the professionals in Sudan or the people of Belarus. I mean, we should be having a you know, like a people-oriented foreign policy, but understanding that this is going to take, you know, quite some time, and that, uh, you know, sometimes things happen that, that that you don't realize. I think, you know, none of us thought that there would be, you know, millions of people in the street in Hong Kong last summer, and of course now it seems a little bit different. But 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 things happen, and I think uh, the, the the very presence of these protests suggests that the demand for democracy is still very strong. Oh, let, let, I could, I, okay, let me just sure. add one one other Go point ahead. real quick on that. Um, you know, I, I I don't think we should be surprised when authoritarians are constantly changing tactics or 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 utilizing new tools because this is an existential fight for them because they have absolutely no chance if they were ever to give power to their people and have to face democratic election or or institutions and accountability. And so the fact that they are changing their tactic and the fact that we are seeing people in the cases that, that Dan and Mike have mentioned that people are still going out into the streets, right? And in Russia as well, we're seeing a tremendous up um, groundswell. Um, it is just a sign that people are saying, we still know what the tactics of these, of these uh, authoritarian regimes are and we're still willing to to stand them down in the streets. And so we're, go we're constantly gonna look for shifts. We're gonna see shifts in what people are willing to do and we'll see shifts in what authoritarians are willing to do. But what that means is for both the people and the authoritarians, this struggle for democracy remains extremely real in their day-to-day -day lives. So I, I, I accept that and, and um, I, I promise I won't be all gloomy, but I, I just, uh, you know, Mike, when you say it's a long struggle, of course it's a long struggle. Um, but I would say that, you know, 20 years ago, those of us who are democracy optimists um, sort of assumed two things. One is that it was a struggle kind of heading in the right direction and that really the other side had no ideology, nothing attractive to author, offer other than wanting to stay in power. And second of all, that these new technologies were gonna work toward openness and toward democracy. Um, and, that both of those in the last few years have at least come under question. And while it's true, uh, Dan, that the hard cases are left, a lot of cases are left now that we didn't think would be cases like Thailand and Turkey and Venezuela. Uh, you know, so yeah, Cambodia has always been a hard case, but um, we've gone backwards in a lot of ways. And so, I mean, is that wrong? And uh, if it's at least partly right, how do you, how does democracy regain the initiative, including with the technologies that, you know, China now seems so capable at using for its own ends? Well, I think you, you answer your own question in a way there, Fred, which is there are some wild cards here that have arisen that, that complicate matters. Technology, digital technology being a major one, both in terms of information, but also its ability to divide and atomize and uh, and not create conditions for a democratic process like consultation and compromise, but polarization. These are things that are working against democracy and are headwinds. Uh, I also agree with you that, I mean, look, uh, 
history is never over in the sense that authoritarians have learned lessons. They learn lessons from an initial wave of democratic moves from people power. They've seen some times where those who have given up power have lost not just power, but their lives. Some now believe they have to hold on. Um, so they're, you know, they're using force and they're telling their, their uh, allies, we have to use force to stay on. So it gets harder and harder as it goes. The momentum is slowed for people power. And the third thing I will say just very quickly is I do want to move away from the notion of a single event or people power being democracy. Uh, we, it does go in kind of waves. And what we're seeing is, you know, we, we see this sort of sexy moment where people take to the streets and they demand power and often sometimes the regime falls and then, you know, people, the opposition takes over. But that's not the end of the story. It is a long term struggle to develop the norms of democracy, the mindset, the culture, the institutions. And what we've seen that you're suggesting is a rollback where the old typically guys who um, had old mindsets were still in the game. They just were playing with new rules, but they were able to game those rules. And, and so democracy is not delivering. It's delivering corruption, it's delivering the old results or, or they're playing with nationalism or xenophobia and other things. So there has to be a new way to bring in new voices, women, young people, others to have a fully inclusive process uh, to bring a new kind of breath of life to democracy. So you're not having the same old ways with different rules, but actually a gradual change of mindset and culture. Uh, otherwise you will get regression, democracy will not deliver and we'll see what we're seeing today, exacerbated by technologies. Fred, could I just say very briefly, I certainly did not intend to sound Pollyannish in my comments. And if you look at the Freedom House scores uh, for the last 14 years, they're very grim. And it, you know, we're, our report's gonna come out in the next few weeks. You know, I, I expect continued grimness. It's a really bad situation. And certainly I think what's also noteworthy is that you know, many of the countries that had protests movements, big protest movements last year, uh, uh, the, you know, they've had setbacks uh, uh, and, and, and pushback from the authoritarians. So it's really quite a grim situation. And then on top of that, something we haven't really talked too much about is the pandemic. You know, we put out a very important study earlier or late in 2020 about how uh, we talked to human rights activists all over the world and they really saw that in most countries in the world, there was uh, you know, setbacks with respect to human rights and democracy. Really, the only country that had an improvement was Malawi, which had a free and fair election after they had had a fraudulent one the last time. So it's a pretty grim situation. And uh, I, I think it's really incumbent upon the Biden administration and all other democracies to really think about what we're going to do to push back against that. Because you know, the old forms of democracy promotion were not working. And that's in part why I feel very strongly that it's really important for all democracies to work on our own you know, situations. Cause I think that's gonna, uh, cause, cause, I, cause the uh, people around the world are looking at how we handle some of these same questions. And even though I do think that US democracy for instance is still you know, a model in many ways, uh, we've got to do better. I, I, I certainly wasn't accusing you of being <clears throat> Pollyannish, Mike, or, or anybody on this panel. I know all of you are involved day to day in the struggle. And um, so let me, let me uh, go back to one piece of it, which um, I think Derek mentioned in his opening remark, and, uh, which is misinformation and um, uh, disinformation and all the new ways that that spreads. Um, there's obviously a huge challenge for democracies on dealing with that <clears throat> while still uh, promoting the values of free speech. And, um, you know, we're struggling with in our, in our country, as you say, Mike, um, what, where do you think, what, what should come next? Are, are there creative things? You know, Biden has talked about uh, a summit of democracies and he's talked about, or his folks have talked about, you know, getting tech democracies in organized to think about these things in, in, a, in opposition to tech dictatorships. Where do you see that going? What, what are the possibilities there uh, in this very, very difficult space? 
somebody must have a solution. Who, who would like to jump in? <clears throat> I don't think any of us have all of the solutions. I think otherwise we would all be jumping in, but let me flag one point and maybe it's a way of uh, deferring and stating any solutions. I think we have to, in light of January 6th, wrestle with two elements of this question about information and, and the manipulation of information. One, we were pretty laser focused on external threats, meaning um, Russia and Chinese and other um, manipulation of information in our country in ways which were not evident to us that they were posing as as alternative sources and things like that 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 citizens were not aware that they were being manipulated, but we obviously on January sixth. Um, wasn't the first time we were aware of it, but obviously this issue and Derek mentioned it as well of parallel information sources and misinformation within a society. In the United States, we fundamentally have two distinct narratives going on just around the election itself, that there are many, many people who believe that the election um, in November was fraudulent. And they believe that those of us who know and believe that it was a free and fair election um, are being duped. And I think having that as a distinct and separate issue um, from the external um, disinformation campaigns which we've faced. I think from the United States' perspective, we have a responsibility, and I think this has to be done at a state and a local level, to begin to um, take the issue of information sources of the quality of journalism and um, citizen education um, on as both a state level issue, but also one which goes directly to the issue of security at a state and national level, because we're seeing that misinformation then used by external sources and by obviously what are domestic violent um, organizations as well. And I think it has to be tackled from a security and a, and, um, and a values perspective. And I would add to this, I mean, we know that the tech companies uh, make a lot of money, the, the tech platforms make a lot of money off this and they need to be both held accountable as reasonable, but regulated reasonably understanding the balance between free speech um, and regulation, because we don't want to be in the business of suppressing speech, at least authentic speech. But again, the algorithms that they have put in place are encouraging the pushing of, of misinformation, disinformation, just to get people to view it. So it's embedded in these technologies, the way they are engineered. So I think the engineers have a lot to say in this. There are many of these engineers who recognize what has occurred, um, and want to change that structure of the way the digital sphere is currently operating. We need to leverage that. We need to also, uh, there's a, something called the Open Technology Fund, you know, help uh, encourage them and fund them again to, because they are giving to entrepreneurs who are thinking about ways to get information into closed societies. And we also have to encourage the networking of what we call civic tech, which is civil society technicians, usually on a volunteer basis. They're very active in Taiwan. The folks who are usually really on the front lines, Taiwan, uh, Estonia, uh, Ukraine, these folks have been you know, the, 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 um, the target of this stuff. We should be using them to think about how do we push back against inauthentic behavior at a popular level and have, and have better information pushed and ensure that there is, as I say, a democratically oriented. So we're encouraging coming together if we're in the digital space, rather than the, the algorithmically pulling apart. That's the only, I mean, it sounds easy or maybe it sounds hard, uh, or, but it's, you know, it's almost structural now. And without a change of that structure, I really do worry about our ability to, to get at this very, very basic problem. Brad, it does. Quick word on the democracy summit, which you had mentioned, you know, this is one of the, you know, the few things that President Biden said about, you know, in the run up to the camp during the campaign that he wanted to do that he wanted to hold a, a summit for democracy. Uh, 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 it's a little bit unclear what he had in mind. And now you've been seeing, you know, some pushback among certain, you know, uh, public intellectuals about, you know, maybe it's not the right time for this. But I think we've seen from the conversation today, you know, what a huge issue the erosion of democracy is. And I think it's really appropriate uh, for the administration to push ahead on this. I think it would really be derelict not for them to, to, to deliver on this, you know, hopefully by, you know, the end of 2021 or early in 2022. And I think it should be an inclusive summit. 
I think civil society should be have a seat at the table during the summit. It should not just be governments. And I think I think there are, you know, I think there's some big issues that we could all work on together that I think, you know, would would, would find a lot of support across many countries, uh, fighting corruption, uh, supporting civil society, uh, uh, a number of things like that. Um, also supporting independent media. I think there's a lot of support. People understand that all over the world, including the United States, uh, there has been pressure on, uh, uh, on, on, on really the bulwark of democracy, which is uh, uh, the ability of, of an independent press to, uh, to function properly and, and to hold government to account. So I think there are a lot of issues that, that could be really uh, the focus of a summit. So I, I hope that the administration does go ahead with this and is not deterred because I think it's really one of the existential challenges of our time. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and Derek, I, I, you know, your comments on the press are, and information really apt. It is such a hard problem. You know, I, I mean, and just as a representative of the media here, I, I would say, you know, we've written editorials over the years about how Facebook, you know, should be more responsible when its platform is being used to promote violence in Myanmar or India. And, um, you know, and now you see, we saw these algorithms used to promote uh, just total lunacy here. Uh, and yet, and so, you know, well, what does that mean if, you know, they're profit mode, they're profit making companies, they're going to want to deepen engagement, uh, keep people on longer, uh, conspiracy theories are a way to do that. So do you regulate them as a utility? Um, uh, do you hope they can regulate themselves? And, you know, I, I would just throw one thing out there, which is the last four years, I mean, I think something needs to change, but the last four years <clears throat> has made me something in my brain think a little bit differently when somebody says regulation, because we saw an administration that was very use, very willing to use the power of the antitrust division and contracting and everything else uh, to punish media organizations and broadly defined, including Twitter, for example, that they thought were not, you know, friendly enough. Uh, and so, um, you know, and, and in a second term, I, I don't have any doubt that we would have seen that deepened and extended. So how do you get, and i uh, throw one other thing, which is, you know, this cancel culture is going to be the theme of the conservative movement in the United States over the next four years. So, you know, and with some legitimate, you know, do we, are we really okay with a few companies saying parlor can't exist anymore? Um, and so really, really hard questions. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Let me ask, a, a, go back to one specific area of the world, because I, I think we're going to go to questions pretty soon. Um, Russia, Belarus and Russia, we've, we've seen Navalny with this incredible courage go back to Russia. Uh, his video with, as was said, over 100 million. Um, but Putin, obviously very determined. Um, wh where do any of you see that going? And do you see the Biden administration or the Biden administration in alliance with others being able to influence that story in any way? Right on Belarus, I mean, one thing that Tikhonovskaya and the uh, democratic leadership has made clear is that this isn't about geopolitics. It's not about moving Belarus West or continuing to be part of the Russian orbit. It's really about Belarusians. And so I think that's one point to keep in mind is that uh, yes, there are always geopolitical implications of democratic openings, but in fact, fundamentally, uh, people are out there uh, peacefully demonstrating in the streets uh, because they're not interested in kind of the axis of world power, they're interested in their own rights and voice. Um, with respect to Russia, I mean, we've come a long way since the Obama-Clinton uh, reset, right? I mean, I think we've all learned a lot about Russia in the last 10, 11, 12 years, uh, including its attempts to influence our own politics and our own elections. So I, you know, it feels to me like our eyes are wide open. Uh, we understand that this is a brittle, declining, insecure uh, 
almost mafiosi sort of regime that Putin is running and that it does not retain the support of the Russian people. Uh, Putin uh, did everything he could to try to stymie uh, Ukraine's uh, series of democratic openings. And Ukraine is an interesting case when we think about uh, Belarus and Russia, Fred, in response to your question, which is that, you know, the Ukrainians didn't get it right the first time. I mean, they argue I had three or four different sort of street revolutions uh, before setting themselves on the current course uh, through the revolution of dignity in 2014. The Orange Revolution in 2004 did not deliver the country that many Ukrainians wanted. So I think we have to be patient that Navalny's protest movement, uh, the Belarusian democratic uprising, uh, these are things that are gonna take time. And again, I would just highlight the legacy of dictatorship is that it's not as if a dictator falls and suddenly you have uh, a thriving, successful society. In fact, that's often when you see uh, all of the damage, the deep, deep damage that has come from legacies of, from just decades of strongman rule. So we're gonna wanna support them in the long run, in the long term. There was, when we were in, when I was in Russia as a reporter after the Soviet Union fell, Russians used to say to me, well, you know, there's a reason that the Jews had to wander in the desert for a generation. And I, it took me a while to understand that what some of them were saying was, you know, these the communists have destroyed morality in a lot of ways. And um, the, the damage that people felt, you know, within their own society was so deep and, and an understanding that it's, it's very hard to repair and it takes time. Um, um, <clears throat> let's see, we have questions, including from some students. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on the future of democracy within the European Union, considering the continuing trend toward right-wing populism in several countries? Somebody wanna? I'll jump in. Um, I mean, I think the challenge that many countries within the European Union, I think that it is a challenge of individual countries as much as it is a challenge of the EU itself, um, is, is going to be how do, you, um, how do you deal with this swing to the right? I mean, I think Germany is dealing with it pretty significantly. Um, I do think that part of it is the citizen education piece, right, about understanding the role of these institutions, but also giving a voice to those who may be more right-leaning, but who are not in the extremist groups, right? I think in a number of countries, and this is some of the challenge that we'll have in the United States, is having legitimate parties that span the spectrum, but don't move into some of the extremist um, extremist wings that we have seen uh, develop on the pr pr primarily on the right, but to some extent on the left as well. Um, and I think once we, if there are if there are institutions, if there are parties that are also um, espousing extremist views, I do think that um, European countries and others outside of Europe will also be challenged to look at if there's a limitation of the access of some of those parties to. Um, to the institutions of power because of the views that they espouse. And I think that is gonna give us another challenging debate around um, freedom of, of, of expression, freedom of speech um, and, and freedom of political participation balanced with some of the values that underpin all democracies. Um, and another question um, about another part of the world. How is the strength of Iran, given that it has been a regional power for thousands of years, impact U.S. policy in the Middle East? Uh, also, how do you think the U.S. should counter Chinese power plays in this region? Um, maybe, uh, I mean, talk about Iran, but and maybe we can broaden it a little bit to, uh, is there a place for thinking about democracy in that part of the world or does the Arab Spring show us that that was just a big mistake and let's go back to realpolitik. Well, that, this is a hard question. I, I jumped the grenade on this one. Uh, this is, uh, look, I, I, there is, I think, space absolutely to promote these democratic values in the region. We see that in the work that NDI does, and not just in Tunisia, but we'll see that in places like Jordan and in Lebanon and even in Yemen uh, in the past, we had seen that before the devastation that occurred there in the proxy war. 
Um, but uh, Iran is a, is a negative influence on all of that. And um, I'm not an expert on US Iran policy or how to deal with Iran. Um, but uh, it seems we have to have a multi kind of pronged approach there that recognizes their uh, damage to um, to liberalism and to, to uh, regional balance of power, as well as deal with the desire within the country for more freedom and more space to express themselves. And you're seeing that bubble up from below. Um, the degree to which we get involved in that actively, uh, whether that helps or hurts, I think we have to be extremely careful on, on that front in terms of what happens inside Iran. But I would, I would, in terms of the region, we absolutely should not dismiss the demand for more voice and more democratic practice in, in the Middle East and North Africa, because it, it is still there. It's just been overrun by, um, you know, vicious autocracy uh, and use of force. Um, and if we say it's a long run anywhere, it's gonna be a long run there. Fred, could I just add, I mean, you know, in the Middle East, the Arab uh, spring flame still burns. Fred, I remember sitting with you at the Munich Security Conference uh, in the waning days of Mubarak uh, and the question of whether he should go uh, as the Obama administration was suggesting. Um, but what you have seen, of course, is just the retrenchment of dictatorship in Egypt and elsewhere. I mean, sort of like we were discussing with Thailand and Burma is that these things do not move a country forward. Um, but really in the Middle East, uh, Iran is the greatest meddler in the politics of Iraq, in the politics of Lebanon, in the politics of Syria. That the Syrian bloodbath actually would not have been possible had Iran not supported Assad, who would have fallen from power at the hands of his own people uh, seven or eight years ago. So, uh, you know, when we talk about democracy, we're not being Pollyannish. Actually, we want people to be able to choose their own course for their country and not have malign foreign actors do that for them. And that brings us to China, which very briefly, um, the Chinese Communist Party has a global set of ambitions to corrupt, coerce, and co-opt using different instruments of sharp power, which is malign forms of soft power influence, uh, to uh, undermine the free and open world uh, that uh, we and our friends and allies have built and sustained and build one that's friend friendly for CCP autocracy and friendly for Chinese Communist Party values and that centers not on uh, the freedom of uh, citizens who have dignity, but that centers on the interests of Xi Jinping and his clique. So uh, we have a substantial challenge ahead of us. Uh, democracy is highly strategic in this context. The independent media, civic watchdogs, uh, a parliamentary oversight to hold political leaders accountable in third countries where the Chinese are attempting to subvert uh, and co-opt uh, their independence, their sovereignty. It's a real mission, I think, for uh, the free world in the period ahead, and it makes democracy highly strategic. So, so let me just follow up on that, Dan, because it is often said, well, the China challenge is different than what the Soviet challenge was because it's not an ideology. Um, and they're not looking for global conquest. They just you know, they want to be an Asia power, they want to be able to sell their stuff and uh, make their loans, but they're not promoting uh, Mao's thought uh, around the world and maybe don't even really believe in it themselves. What do you think about that? Is that a misinterpretation? <clears throat> you know, I think it is. I think it is ideological. Uh, they want to uh, they want to turn upside down the norms and values of a free and open world and replace them with something very different that is hierarchical, that leads other countries to submit to them. Uh, and other, other countries don't deal on an even playing field when it comes to China, because as a Chinese foreign minister famously said, China is bigger than everyone else. So we're not gonna have an equal relationship. In fact, he said that to the Singaporean foreign minister, which shocked everybody uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So uh, I see it as ideological, uh, and, but it really, Fred, it's about uh, regime stability and preservation. The CCP is both highly aggressive and ambitious and also highly insecure. And they believe that a world in which democracy is on the march is not a safe world for them to hold on to power uh, because the Chinese people might get other ideas from what has happened, for instance, in South Korea and in Taiwan and in Indonesia and in all of these neighboring countries where it turns out that democracy actually uh, works okay. Why, why can it not work in China when it can work everywhere else? And why were Hong Kong citizens, the richest Chinese, the richest, uh, why did they stand up so vigorously to CCP assault? Uh, because they understand that life isn't simply about prosperity, it's about rights and dignity and freedom. 
Yeah, and I, I, just to add very quickly, I know we want to get to other questions, but it doesn't. It, it's not about exporting Maoism, in, and it doesn't matter what whether they want to uh, shape the other governments. But they're creating a world that really is. They're trying to shape a world that works for its own interests. I mean, purely its own interests. While we have tried to shape a world that works for the broader general interest, uh, and that very sort of self-regard, self-regarding policy, and that very aggressive, they have the resources to take us on. They see us as absolutely the competitor, if not the enemy. And they see democracy is not working necessarily for their own uh, 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 general national interest. So whether we call it, it's certainly not like the Cold War of the past. We're not gonna, we can't divide the world into blocks, but that makes it an even more complicated challenge for us. Uh, and we do have to recognize as Dan suggests, which we haven't for a long time. And it's not just because of China, but that governance is strategic. The way countries are governed, the way they govern themselves and the way the international system is governed and the norms and values by which these things operate, both national governments and international governance matters strategically. And I'm not sure the United States until really gets that and has really thought about it in a strategic fashion as they need to, to, to develop the kind of world that we think will truly work to the global interest and not just the single countries. <clears throat> we have a question to all panelists. <clears throat> what would be effective ways to deal with dictatorships that are really organized crime narco states, such as Venezuela, which poses a close proximity threat to the US? Will the Biden administration commit to bringing democracy back to Venezuela? And how do you think they'll go about it? And I would just add in there, since we are all virtually in Florida right now, if somebody wants to add Cuba to that question, uh, what do you think the Biden administration policy should be or will be? Um, and what are the prospects of bringing democracy or Cubans bring, being allowed to bring democracy to their own country? Nicole, you wanna? Yep, yeah, I'll jump in on a couple issues there. Um, there are activists in Cuba and activists in, um, in Venezuela who are extraordinarily courageous and have been working for many, many decades in the case of Cuba and more recently um, in, in Venezuela to push back on authoritarian government. And um, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to support those activists and support others who are working either outside of the country or in each of those respective countries um, to put, continue to push back on the governments. I think it's also important that we use our diplomatic leverage with other countries in the region um, to continue to um, form a, a block of countries that stand in solidarity with those activists on the ground, right? We've obviously see throughout Latin America, the vast majority of countries are democracies, some struggling, but many of them solid democracies, and the importance of developing a consistent voice within the Americas to stand up to non-democratic forces and governments is going to be important, because when that doesn't happen, um, many of these um, many of these authoritarian governments find allies within the region, and if we can break that um, that we can also then um, start start to form a more solid block against authoritarian regimes. Or could I just add quickly? We've talked about the summit for democracy and the need for democracies to work together to pretend the free, to protect the free world. Um, autocracies work together, and one reason that uh, Maduro's criminal rule has been sustained in Venezuela is the active support. Uh, of Cuba, uh, primarily Cuba, also Russia, also China, also Iran. And a lot of this relates to the international smuggling and illicit networks that provide his regime with revenue. You know, Venezuela is sitting on more oil than any country in Latin America. Uh, and uh, that oil is not being traded with uh, law abiding democracies. So uh, I think one thing for us to focus in on a little more, just as the Russians and the Chinese have started working together in quite innovative ways to uh, protect their authoritarian systems, including by going on offense against the, the free world. Uh, it is uh, dictatorships that have sustained dictatorship in Venezuela over the heads of the Venezuelan people. And boy, do they resent it. Uh, Fred, the, 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 just to add on my end, uh, the, the part of the question that kind of resonated with me, I'm not really sure exactly what to do about Venezuela. That's a hard one. That's, you know, that's as much of a failed state as a... Uh, as, as a dictatorial one, but I do think, you know, putting a focus on fighting corruption and making it hard for people like Maduro or people like Putin or their cronies, you know, to park money 
uh, in the uh, banking systems and financial systems of free societies. I think actually the, the U.S. Congress has actually at the end of 2020, you know, began, you know, taking some important steps to doing that. Uh, there's also been the Magnitsky sanctions, which uh, you know have, are, are just starting to have teeth uh, uh, around the world. There's more that can probably be done with those. So I think you know a great deal of focus on really targeted efforts to prevent the bad guys from from uh, uh, from parking their ill-gotten gains, which is really a hallmark of these kleptocracies and authoritarian settings. I think that will be a very important thing for democracies to work together on. And, and I suppose it's important to do it in time in particularly in vulnerable democracies so that you get there before that, that wealth can, be, <clears throat> can begin to play a role in corrupting the democracy itself. Is that, would that be fair? Uh, yes, absolutely. And because I, I think you, you've seen from you know, cases like Russia where you know, it's, it's really an early warning system of, of larger democratic decay when you see uh, you know, the oligarchs around Putin being able to plunder the uh, uh, state resources for their own benefits. And so I think you know, the same analogy would hold for other countries that are you know, at a different stage of their transition. See if we have time for one more. Um, what role does academia play in the preservation and promotion of democracy? <clears throat> Anybody want to take that on? We have one academic here. I guess, yeah, I guess <laughs> I should jump in on that. Um, I think one of the most crucial roles that academia can and should play, and I'm not sure that it is playing consistently around the world, I'll say FIU does it very, very well through this conference, is putting forward diverse views and illustrating for students the importance of civil and rigorous debate about public policy issues. We have seen, um, we have seen a slide towards only putting up views which we all feel comfortable and happy about. And I'm not arguing that we should put up extreme and radical views on the far left or the far right, but I do think that we potentially are sliding towards a generation of people who are not used to seeing um, a group of people like this rigorously debate each other and then walk off the stage and go have lunch together. And we're forgetting that it is very, very possible within the legitimate spectrum of diverse views on a specific issue um, that it's important to a society that we have that civil debate and that we have a debate ab about diverse views. And it's okay if we say immigration can look this way or that way and we're gonna debate it out rigorously and then we're still gonna be friends on the other side. Um, we're losing that, and to the extent that we're not reinforcing that in a younger generation, we will be paying for that in years to come in how um, our younger people vote and how our younger people engage in society within a diverse society. Great point. <clears throat> Although I just would like to point out that Kramer didn't invite me to the lunch that I guess all of you are invited <laughs> to the panel. But, um, <clears throat> uh, so I promise it wouldn't all be gloomy. We have three minutes left. Um, I would like to say, and, and so I'd like to ask each of you quickly, what's something that gives you hope? Um, you know, it, it gives me hope that we have a lot of really great people who are still working and fighting for this. I think it's hopeful that over the last four years, uh, Congress continued to fund organizations uh, that you represent, even when the administration might not have been that enthusiastic about it. Um, and uh, so I think it's been a great panel, but, but let me just, uh, ask each of you, you know, at the beginning, I asked, what are you worried about? T tell me one thing that, that gives you some cause for optimism as you look at the world. Nicole, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure, I'll just start with the, the courage of activists on the ground. We are seeing around the world people, and whether they are young people, whether they are people of one particular faith or women's groups, or just activists who are willing to stand up for Navalny's um, uh, imprisonment. They are doing things which are far, far harder than any of us sitting in Washington. And they continue to face um, governments that are willing to imprison and beat and in many cases kill them. Um, and they believe and understand in uh, the promise of democracy and they're willing to, to put that into action. And I think that gives all of us courage who are not facing those challenges, but are facing challenges at home and abroad to double down, get in the game and to work harder for these values at home and abroad. 
Fred, we haven't talked much about Sub-Saharan Africa, but I'm just so hopeful. I mean, I grew up there. The median age in Sub-Saharan Africa is 19. And these young people are technologically empowered. Uh, they know what life looks like in the wider world. They are not going to put up with these corrupt old strongmen who are clinging to power. Uh, you've seen uh, some of this in Uganda. You've seen it in Zimbabwe. It's not great news everywhere. But young people want to be modern. And they understand that being modern means having political rights and a political voice and not letting some guy run the country for 40 or 50 years, as has happened, for instance, in Cameroon. Derek? Uh, oh, I, I was just going to weigh in, Fred. I, I think what gives me hope is the incredible and amount of great investigative reporting that's still going on uh, in our country and also around the world. I mean, honestly, the way we know about <laughs> the problems of kleptocrats and dictators and authoritarians, even in places like China. You know, think about the work that Radio Free Asia did to highlight the abuses against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. So I think that really does give me hope because information is the key to uh, unlocking uh, uh, the end to dictatorships. And so I, that, that's the one thing that gives me hope and that's why it's so important from my point of view, for that to be continued to be nurtured. My colleagues have said it very eloquently. There's not much more to add. I think it's that resilience that people have, that natural drive you're seeing in the younger generation, we've talked about a lot in the last hour and a quarter, that it, it still remains very strong. If you see it within universities and young people around the world, it's usually channeled towards climate change or particular issues. And the challenge will be to harness that energy harness that demand in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, in, in Latin America, in Asia, uh, to productive political ends and show that it can be different and that it can deliver because they know the alternative doesn't work for them. And the last thing is we have to not lose our, our resolve in this. And so far we haven't. And I think our, our commitment, our recognition that we are in for a challenge in coming years is, is good, that we're starting to wake up to the challenge that, that we face and to look at it very seriously. Um, I think if we all bind together the democratic forces, which vastly overwhelm the non-democratic forces around the world, that we can at least have a chance to turn this around even in the face of technologies and authoritarian learning. Well, <clears throat> you all have said that very eloquently and I, I would just agree. I, I mean, the courage, the unimaginable courage that people show every day, including people in my business who go out and report knowing their life could be in danger. And, you know, just young and old people who go out in the streets, you know, knowing we're never going to know their names, they're not going to, but just showing incredible uh, resolve um, because people do want the dignity of self, self, rule and self-expression and <clears throat> so it gives us the responsibility to keep working uh it's their fight but to do what we can um and so thank you all of you thanks uh, uh to david and his colleagues for ho hosting this inviting us on this panel and hosting this conference um and i'll turn it back to him Fred, thanks so much. And uh, thanks to Nicole, Dan, Derek, and Mike for an outstanding panel. A great way to cover our theme for the conference, the struggle for democracy, and also a great way to end on uh, points of optimism. So thanks so much to all of you for joining us. Really appreciate it. And, and keep up the, the critical work that you do. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take another break here uh, and be back at 1230 for our next panel, which is the challenges at home, polarization and forces pulling us apart. So uh, you can just keep your Zoom going if you want, or you can click back on, uh, grab a bite to eat and join us at 1230. Thanks again to a terrific panel, appreciate it. To the end like an elbow, fingers getting stuck to the money. Velcro. Will I ever? Well known to OG like a pair of shell toes. Never mad, just motivated. We going places, and life is a game, so it comes with stages. We only trading money, we not trading places. Benji Franklin's is my favorite, only face I'm ever saving. Working hard.
for that number one spot. No, we can never be stopped. I, I work. Say I'm dedicated. I work. Gotta be the great.